Thanks so much, and uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Are we still in the morning? This morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Yulia Panfil, and I'm the director of a program called The Future of Land and Housing at the Think Tank New America. And it was funny, I was t uh, telling Emily earlier this morning that our program, when it was founded about six years ago, we were called The Future of Property Rights. But we renamed it because we realized that nobody knew what we were talking about. <laughs> so if I'd known then that four years later, or five years later, I'd be standing in this room, maybe I would have kept the name. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking Corinna for the land invocation and Ramsey for your introduction, uh, really centering, around, centering us around the sacredness of land and the sense of place. Um, my place, where I'm from, where I was born, is a beach. It's a rocky beach on the banks of the Black Sea in southern Ukraine. And that beach is now full of mines uh, as a result of trying to repel an aggressor who is engaged in the oldest form of competition over land and territory. And I don't know if uh, I'll ever be able to step foot on that beach again. And it was interesting, I was reflecting, I wasn't planning to say this, but I was reflecting on it as you were speaking, that I haven't actually been to Odessa since 2015, but it's amazing how much um, it's painful to think that I might not be able to uh, go there again or be on that beach again. I think it speaks to really the deep ways in which we're rooted to our place that we're from, even when, it, when we don't think about it in our everyday lives necessarily. So I just wanted to offer that. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah. I'll also offer that after this morning, my head is swimming a little bit. I don't know if others are in the same boat. <laughs> so I'll just say up front that I don't have a lot of crisp summations or conclusions. Really, I'll just talk about a couple of the things that bubbled up for me as I was trying to prepare for this conversation. Um, Matt, you invited me to think a little bit about how these ideas of our current regime of property rights manifest in the area that I most work in, which is US housing. Um, and I also tried to bring in a few examples. I work on domestic uh, property rights issues mostly now, but my background is actually in international development. I used to do uh, land rights work uh, with USAID and others. So I've seen a few other places that have done property rights in ways that might be a little bit different than uh, what we think of here. So I've uh, tried to bring a few of those perspectives in as well. Um, so these are just a few starting points that sort of bubbled up for me as I was reading through the Desiderata paper and some of the materials that were circulated before the convening. And the first that really spoke to me was this idea that when property rights are permanent, exclusive, and monetizable, that this really accelerates inequality and power concentration. And I would put a slight spin on this to say that property rights to a large extent are monetizable because they're permanent and exclusive. And then also this idea that uh, an appropriation must always leave enough and as good in the unknown domain is a serious problem for anyone who wants to endorse private property interests in natural capital, meaning land, resources, and so on. Um, and those are just kind of two of the things that I was thinking about most as I started thinking about this topic. Next slide. Okay, so in the US, uh, I was thinking about the two, starting, taking the desiderata as jumping off points, the two ways in which it is most obvious to me working in the US housing field, how the current property rights regime really leads to poor outcomes. And this first image is uh, 
Matt, you used a very similar one in your opening, and uh, it's one that I think we're all very familiar with, that uh, just this in extreme inequality that is caused by uh, pro private property ownership. Uh, in the US right now, uh, Harvard just put out this statistic about two weeks ago, that half of US renters are now housing cost burdened, which means that they spend more than a third of their income on rent. And about a third of US renters are what's called severely housing cost burden, which means that they spend more than half of their income on rent. Um, housing prices, uh, rent it has increased by a tremendous amount. It's outpaced wage inflation over the last 15 years or so by about 270%. Um, oh, one back. Thank you. And then the other is this idea that you sort of, you have to spend money to make money. And the way that we, right, you have to be relatively well off to be able to purchase property in this country. And at the same time, property ownership is one of the principal ways to build material wealth. So it's this sort of circular system where you can't even step onto the first rung of that economic ladder without um, some capital, which perpetuates inequality. So what's broken? Um, you know, as I said, if the root of the issue is that property rights are increasingly permanent and exclusive and thus monetizable, then Arguably, some solutions we might think about lie with models that are either less permanent or less exclusive. And I think that the partial common ownership model that um, Radical Exchange, I know we'll be talking about that a lot during this talk, uh, really tries to untangle some of these concepts and kind of unpack the different sticks in the bundle of rights to address some of these issues. Um, but I also wanted to bring in a couple of models that I've seen uh, from other parts of the world that have um, approached property rights a little bit differently. This is absolutely not exhaustive. Uh, these are just a few threads that can maybe stimulate some ideas. With the point being that societies and communities do it all sorts of ways. Um, I'll start with... Oh, we can go back one, yeah. In, in Ghana, uh, a system of customary rights that I think actually has a lot of similarities with partial common ownership is basically a nested system where the chief um, of a chiefdom has what's called an allodial right to the land. It's the highest interest in land and the chief holds the land in trust for the living, the dead, and those not yet born. And then underneath the allodial right, the chief grants basically life estates or use rights to the people living in the community and charges a land tax. In Mozambique, this gets to this issue of can you just speculate on land? Can you hold land empty, not do anything to it, and co continue deriving value? In Mozambique, uh, uh, kind of one of the most prevalent systems of land holding is through what are called duots. Duots are basically <laughs> lifetime or long time use rights. So long as the user puts that land into productive use that's specified at the time when they apply for that land from the government. And then in the US, um, you know, this gets to permanence. Some communities in New Hampshire and elsewhere are experimenting in coastal areas that are, you know, experiencing rapid erosion and that are grappling with this um, idea of climate adaptation. How do you, uh, how do you encourage people to move away from parts of the country that may not be uh, safe to live on in the coming decades. They're uh, experimenting with an idea called life estates, where basically the holder of the land has a lifetime ownership right, but at the end of their right, it reverts to the government and the heir gets a payout. 
Next slide. And then I think that we'll be speaking a lot during the next uh, couple of days about community land trusts, and there are people in this room who are far more knowledgeable about CLTs than I am, so I won't belabor the point. Um, and Katerina, you spoke about the various cooperative housing models that are prevalent across Europe, Vienna, social housing is one of the better known examples. So there are many models in which either the government owns the land and the housing, rents it out at affordable rates in bulk, or people own land and then build the housing and invest in it cooperatively. So there are different models that are in practice across the world for less exclusive property ownership. Next slide. So I'll just end with a couple of considerations. And these are, again, just snippets that um, stood out to me as I was thinking through this exercise. The first is, how do we think about the difference between natural capital, like land, and then housing, artificial capital, when that housing is immovable from the natural capital upon which it sits? And I think CLTs grapple with this um, conundrum in a really interesting way, but I think that that's one that's worth thinking about. The other is, how do we deal with the intangible value of a home as a sense of place? Right, so a home has financial value, but also it has you know, that, that sense of being in a place, living in a certain, putting down roots, structuring your community and your society around the place in which you live does have a certain, not a certain, a great intangible value. How do you, how do you hold that in parallel with the financial value of it as an asset? Um, oh, back just one. Uh, how do we build trust as we think about new ownership paradigms? And then finally, uh, and this is something that Linda, I think that you alluded to, when we're talking about rethinking how and what we own when, it talks, when, it, when we talk about housing, are we talking about only new housing that will be built moving forward? Or are we talking about existing housing, all of the housing that's currently owned by people? How do we unravel that? Do we unravel that? Final slide. I'll just end with this. Um, Katerina, you uh, spoke, and I think Marguerite, you also wrote about this, that oftentimes these big structural changes happen amidst some sort of a macro forcing function. And I would argue that in the US, climate change will present a forcing function that will cause us to really rethink our relationship with property and homes, and may provide an opportunity for us to experiment with some new models. So we already know, it's already happening across the US, uh, that private ownership of homes in climate vulnerable areas presents several challenges. Um, you know, for, uh, it can be a barrier for cohesive climate adaptation. So communities who are trying to fund community level buyouts and relocation, you have the issue of holdouts, right? Who don't want to sell. Uh, for the government, the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, right, provides flood insurance to coastal homeowners. It's underwritten by the government. It's completely underwater, no pun intended. Uh, NFIP every year takes in about $5 billion in fees and pays out about $20 billion. And that's right now. Um, we know that buyout schemes create uh, winners and losers. Um, that the biggest predictor of whether a city or a town um, implements a buyout and moves away isn't the level of need, but actually the wealth of the community. Um, and then finally, we know that going forward, homes are gonna become uninsurable. It's already happening in parts of California. Banks are no longer gonna be writing 30-year mortgages, right? And you see this principle kind of going back to the beginning of uh, property being a principal source of wealth for so many homeowners, it's gonna evaporate. So all of those things together, I think, create actually an opportunity and this mass movement, the, the projections vary wildly, but somewhere between 20 and 50 million Americans may need to move because of climate change by 2100. So I think that all of these factors together 
do create a bit of a forcing function and an opportunity potentially for us to think about how we rethink property regimes in the US over the, over the coming decades. Thanks.